And Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you do overwhelm us, that you are greater, that you are bigger than us. And so, Father, we've come to this place once more to submit ourselves to your word. And we pray, Father, that we would finish the week well and that we would start the next week well also. And so, Father, again, the things that you have to teach us and instruct us in, I pray, Father, that we would be receptive of them. I pray, Father, that we would be faithful in doing them, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you turn and greet your neighbor? Greetings. Sean, it's dark. <laughs> Go ahead and turn your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 63. Before we start, a couple of things. First of all, apologize that there's no uh, presentation tonight. My wife was going to do it, but she got a call from Lorraine. Lorraine wanted her to come and spend some time with her. Lorraine is a lady who has ministered at our church for many years. And um, she was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. It's very serious. And um, she's just recovered from some preliminary preliminary surgery. And uh, she's going to be going through chemo. And it's quite serious. So keep Lorraine up in prayer if you think of Lorraine. Isaiah chapter 63. I'll start reading at verse 1. Go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. I'm just going to go to the first two verses and we'll go through the rest of the chapter today. Isaiah 63, verse 1. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, this one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? Father, once again, as we look at these things that are going on in the future, I pray that you would give us a hope and assurance today that we would be well-versed in these things as we see the things that are going on within our society, we would understand, Lord, that you are in control. Things are not spiraling out of control. They're falling into place. And so, Father, as our hope is in you, we just pray, God, that you would reveal your truth to us in such a way that you would strengthen us for the day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. What we've been looking at in the book of Isaiah is things that were going on in the millennial age. Now, we get to this place that, it, theoretically, somebody could ask, and that's what the prophet is presenting, how did we get to this place, and what happened to the nations? Well, we know, as we've gone through the Gospels and the Epistles, and we get into the, the details of the things that the Lord has for us, well, that first coming of Christ, it made for mankind's peace. Jesus Christ came, he died upon the cross, he paid the price for our sins. And because he has paid the price for our sins, we move forward seeking the Lord's ministry, seeking to be well-pleasing to our God. But it's going to be the second coming of Christ when he is going to come in judgment. And it's important to understand and realize the reality of the judgment that God is going to bring. Because it's in the light of judgment that we truly, or maybe I should say it's in the dark backdrop of judgment, that we see the glory of God's grace. Without judgment, does grace even exist? Why would you need grace if there wasn't judgment? So it's important to understand these end-time events and the things that are going on. Now, I mentioned the millennial time, just real quick, if anybody doesn't understand or if maybe you forgot or whatever, just in way of review, we understand there was the Old Testament times, Christ was prophesied, and then in that period of time, according to the Lord's timing, there was the coming of Jesus Christ. The Lord sent his Son. We know that he died upon the cross, he was resurrected, and ascended to heaven. And in Acts chapter 2, we see where he sent the Holy Spirit, and the church age was established. For the past 2,000 years or so, we have been living in the church age. But there's going to come that time, and it's going to happen at a moment in the twinkling of an eye, when the Lord is going to come back for his church. It's what we call the rapture of the church. After the rapture of the church is going to enter in, society is going to enter into that time of tribulation, seven years of tribulation, three and a half years of tribulation, three and a half years of great tribulation, where the earth is going to be set upon its ear. We who are born-again believers, excuse me, 
will not be here to experience that. We would have been raptured, we'll be instantly with the Lord. But the thing that will flow through is our witness. The words that we have spoken and the gospel that we have shared, the kids that we have raised, if they in fact are not walking in the Lord, whoever it might be, the influence that we are able to have will extend through the rapture. And during the time of the rapture, people will get saved. But it's going to be, and this is pretty much where we're going to be tonight, is in uh, Revelation chapter 19, in the second coming of Christ. We are told that Christ is going to come back, and he's going to come back as a conquering king. All the armies of the world are going to be gathered together in that valley of Armageddon. And as I said before, I was there, and I could see how all of the armies would fit in that valley. Just think of it once again as the valley that we live in, bordering with the mountains that are on our south, or the hills that are to the south of us, and then the mountains that are to the north of us. And as you come over, say, from Pomona on the 60 freeway, you kind of just see this huge valley, and you can see how the armies of the world could gather in that. Well, the va valley of Armageddon is about that size. And so you can see the reality of it. Now the devil is going to, really the Antichrist, is going to deceive them, and they're going to be doing battle or arriving there to do battle against one another. But then Christ is going to come, and they'll turn their attention to him. He's coming on that white horse, and we will be following on our own horses. It's not, <clears throat> it's not going to be much of a battle in that he is going to speak a word, and the armies of the world will fall down before him. We're not there for the purpose of fighting. We are there for the purpose of witnessing. It's going to be after that time that the devil is thrown into a dungeon, if you will, that the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into what we would refer to as hell, and then all others will be taken, unbelievers, to that place called Hades until the time of the great white throne judgment. But it's going to be at that time that the millennial age will start, a thousand years that we will live and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's as if the Lord is giving one last chance for mankind at least to display the reality of the sinful nature of man. Judgment will come instantaneous. It says the Lord will rule with an iron rod. We will be those by his side, again, ruling and reigning with Christ for a period of a thousand years. We will be ru ruling and reigning over those who have come through the tribulation as they continue to marry and to bear children. Then after the end of a thousand years, the devil will be released. He will deceive the nations once again. Once again, they'll rise up, they'll surround Jerusalem, but the result is going to be the same. With a word from his mouth, Christ will destroy all enemies that oppose him. And then we are going to see the great white throne judgment. Those who are apart from Christ, died apart from Christ, they will be condemned forever. The earth will be destroyed. And then there will be a new heaven and a new earth, a place that we will live with the Lord where there's no more tears and there's no more pain. It's the great hope that we have within us. And so as we've been looking at elements of the millennial age now, how did we arrive at that point? And what happened to the nations? Well, we're going to see that chapter 63 here tonight is divided into two sections. The first will be the destruction of those who are contrary to the Lord. Those who have refused the goodness of God did not repent, and now they're going to receive judgment. Again, we have to be mindful. There is the reality of judgment. It's part of the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see this in verses 1 through 6. And then secondly, the second section is in verses 7 through 19. And this is a prayer of praise against the backdrop of judgment with the fresh knowledge of the love of God. Again, it's as if the prophet is seeing this and understanding that God has delivered us from these things. God has delivered us from the judgment of the world. And so what, what the prophet does, what Isaiah does, he, he bursts out in this, this prayer that is, is just, well, it's just oozing with praise, if you will. And we need to have that same mindset. We need to have a fresh awareness of the grace of God daily, that you were headed for destruction, but the Lord reached down. He brought somebody into your life. That person preached the gospel to you, and you submitted yourself to the Lord. You were, you were saved. I mean, just the word salvation speaks of a destruction that was coming upon us all. And so God, who is rich in his grace and mercy, yet while we were still sinners, he died for us. He saved us. But as for now, Psalm 110, verse 1 says, The Lord said to my Lord, 
Yahweh said to my Adonai, King David is writing this, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. What does it mean to make an enemy your footstool? Well, back then in the days of the gladiators and all, when you would defeat an opponent, you would put your foot on his neck. And that's the whole idea here until the enemies of God are brought to complete and total defeat, then, well, the Lord continues to sit. But one day, he's going to rise up, and he's going to come back for his church. And so the things that we see working in, in this world, across this world today, the things that we see going on in the Middle East, the same things that we see going on in our own country, they're all working towards that end. See, when God judges, he's going to judge truly and he's going to judge rightly. Everybody that stands before the throne of God, what does Romans chapter 3 verse 19 says? It says, every mouth will be stopped. That means that God's righteousness will be well apparent. When God's righteousness will be well apparent, then the sinful nature of mankind will be well apparent and man will have absolutely no excuse to be able to offer before a holy God. And we see that even peppered throughout the book of Revelation when mankind would curse God. These horrible catechismic events would be happening and man knows he could repent, but instead he curses God. He recognizes that these things are coming from God, but again, we see how hard-hearted mankind can be. So with this understanding, we see the first section of this chapter is about judgment of the nations and it opens with two questions. And the first question is in verse 1. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, the one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? The man of who this question is asked of is on the road from Basra. Now, Basra was the capital of Edom. Edom is south, southeast from Israel. It's pretty much south with Jerusalem. It's modern-day Jordan. But it was that time when there was um, Ezra and, uh, and, and I, not, yeah, Isaac, Isaac, <laughs> Ezra and Isaac, and, and how they were, they were, or, I'm sorry, Jacob, now, how they were fighting against one another, and there was never that joining together. And they ended up, well, we know what happened with Jacob, but as far as Ezra, Ezra went and he settled in Edom. And Edom has always been apart from God's people. They've been contrary to God while they've been contrary to God's people. So although Edom was a relative of Israel, they had a vicious attitude towards Israel. Amos is about the judgment that was to come upon Edom. In Amos chapter 1, verses 11 through 12, it says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because he punished his brother with a sword and cast off all pity. His anger tore perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. So Basra is the capital of Edom and the capital represents the totality of the country but Edom is really representing all nations that are contrary to God by being contrary to Israel. And the idea is, is this man, this man who is coming down this road, if you will, he's just exercised judgment, or at least has the uh, appearance of just exercising judgment. When the question asked, is asked, who is this? Well, there's a reason, because of the stained garments, but the stained garments that are also mixed with the glory that we see here. And it's as if he's saying, well, well, who's this? I mean, it's a very emphatic statement. It's an emphatic statement that will demand an answer. And so the prophet looks at him, who is this? And he makes three observations. This person's garments are dyed, this person's glorious apparel, and this person's great strength. So first, the garments that are dyed are such as a soldier coming back from war. Now, keep in mind, in those days, battles, they were up close and personal. They would be fought man to man, face to face, with sword or javelin or whatever it might have been. And even the victor in a battle such as that, he would probably be just as bloody as the loser was. And so the idea is this man looks like he's coming back from a great slaughter. His clothing is all dyed with blood. 
in Revelation chapter 19, verses 13 through 14, it speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back. It says, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on a white horse. And so the idea is this is a great king who has marched into war, has been victorious, and has conquered the enemy. Next we see that he's got glorious apparel. This would be the glory of God shining through the stains of blood or the stains of judgment. If blood stains are the sign of judgment, then we see this glorious apparel, and what it speaks of is a glorious judgment. It had to be close to what was observed back in Matthew chapter 17 when Peter and John and James got that appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ on that Mount of Transfiguration. In Matthew chapter 16, it says in verse 27, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. And surely I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. When it says they will not see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, that's the Greek word basileia, can also be translated in his glory. Because what did Jesus just tell them? He had just told them earlier in chapter 16 that he was going to be crucified, that he was going to be killed, but he was also going to be resurrected. And again, we saw that until the Holy Spirit was sent, they never really grasped this concept. But they are going to have an object lesson, if you will, here in chapter 17. It says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And so these men who had lived with Jesus Christ all of this time, and now the Lord just tells them some very hard things, but they're not understanding that. And then they get to go up on that mountain, these three men, and they see Jesus transform right before their very, life, their very eyes. They see the glory of God, and they're not going to understand the totality of what's going on. But again, Christ had told them of a resurrection from the death would be something very strange to them, but now they're understanding the concept of a body that is brought back or a life that is brought back and has received this glorified body and at this point is now able to live and, and, and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ, live and reign in the presence of God. Again, as we were standing on Mount Carmel, Mount Carmel overlooks the Jezreel Valley or the Valley of Megiddo and, or Armageddon. And on the other side, you can see the Mount of Transfiguration. And I was just st sitting there thinking, man, that'd be an amazing thing, just to be able to have this view for all of history and see everything that went on. To see, okay, over that mountain, that's where Gideon came in and attacked the enemy as they were in that valley. And then on that mountain there, that's the Mount of Transfiguration. If you were there, especially if it was evening time, you'd see the glory of God upon that mountain and you'd see much history play out. If you would look off to your left, you would see there's, there's Nazareth right there, and that's the place where the Lord lived. And as I've said before, it's kind of an amazing thing. The Lord lived in a place that he overlooked this valley where he's going to come back at some point in history. And you see all of these things laid out before you, and it's an amazing thing. As I said so many times before, if you get the opportunity to go to Israel, you're not going to see the glory of the Lord such as... Peter, John, and James did, but you'll see some pretty glorious things that will stay with you, I'm sure, to the rest for the rest of your life. And then thirdly, he sees this man, he sees this man's great strength. He sees the strength of this man. He's understanding, I don't know exactly how, but he is. In Revelation chapter 11, verses 17 through 18, we're told, these 24 elders, they give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and the one who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. So again, verse 1, back in Isaiah chapter 63, who is this comes from Comes from Edom. So he's understanding. He's coming from this Gentile country. It's representing the nations of the world. 
with dyed garments from Basra. It's the capital, so he was in there, and somehow, some way, his garments became dyed. We understand this to be the blood of the slain. The one who is glorious in his apparel, and it's the righteousness of God, and righteousness of God with this stained blood speaks of a righteous judgment, traveling in the greatness of his strength, and that he is able to overcome all who are in opposition from him. And then we have an answer to this question, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. First, we see the joining together of this man's speech and judgment. I who speak in righteousness. Now again, we saw in the book of Revelation when Christ comes back in verses 17 through 21, how it's going to be in that which overcomes those nations who are in opposition. Verse 17 says, again, Revelation chapter 19 Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of the people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured with him and the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with his flesh. So again, an amazing thing. Now setting that aside, but just look at prophet Isaiah didn't have the book of Revelation. I don't know to what degree he understood this, but really what he's seen is the magnitude of his God. The magnitude of God and the righteous judgment of our Lord. And really, again, what that should lead us to is the realization of the grace of God. The grace of God that is going to keep us from that judgment to come. The grace of God that not only keeps us from the judgment, that also brings us unto himself. We examine our lives, we know our lives, we know the imperfect people we are, but still God has lavished his love upon us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, how great is the love that the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. We've got that privileged position. The world, the world's in despair. We've got that privileged position of being children of God. Last week at this time, well, we were finished by this time, but last week, it was one again, one of those blessed times in, in, in the existence of our church as we celebrated our 18th birthday, but we also celebrated a time of baptism. And it was just a neat thing, being in that pool and seeing people come in and, and people understanding and knowing they're doing what God has called them to do. And I see there was one particular lady that came in who was very emotional about it. And again, it's just an exciting thing just to see that in the eyes of people. We set the stage, but we can't cause that to happen. This happens because of the relationship that they have with the Lord and they understand the magnitude of the grace of God that they're able to come in the midst of people such as that and to be able just simply to give God glory. And so we, we do have such, such privilege because we are children of God and we, we can never truly forget that. We then see the deity of, that is attached to this man when he says that he is mighty to save. Because, well, we'll just look at Isaiah, but Isaiah spells it out for us. Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Nobody else is mighty to save other than God. This is a work that comes from God. That's why we have the Old Testament. We have 4,000 years of the Old Testament. Man, according to the word that was delivered, making the sacrifice, trying to work out his salvation apart from God, keeping all of these works and keeping all of these commandments and comes to the realization he can't even keep 10, let alone 613 commandments. And that was the fullness of God's time when he sent his son and the love and the grace of God was revealed to mankind. The idea behind the statement, mighty to save, His salvation, the salvation that the Lord provides is strong enough, is broad enough, and it's abundant enough to achieve its purpose. It's strong enough, even the most decrepit sinner can be saved and washed clean. It's broad enough that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And it's abundant enough that it's enough simply for us 
to be right with God and again to be brought into his family. This brings us to the second question. Why is your apparel red? Verse 2, why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? In Joel chapter 3, verse 13, we have this illustration. Joel is speaking towards this time as well. We have this illustration of a wine or at least a grape harvest. It says, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down for the wine press is full. The vats overflow for their wickedness is great. Well, it's kind of interesting. That's how Joel says that. In Revelation, there's something very similar of an of a, uh, angel putting a sickle into the, into the grapes and the blood starting to flow. Again, it's a picture of the judgment that's coming. Well, Basra, Basra literally means gathering of grapes. And so God has, has caused all of these illustrations to come together so that we would have a rich picture of the judgment that is going to come. This is going to be absolute judgment. Now, in the Bible, when you see the letting of blood, it speaks of the death of either the sacrifice or the individual. There was the letting of blood of bulls and goats, that continuous necessity for the covering of sins. We talk about the blood of the lamb or the blood that was shed upon the cross. That speaks of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we see blood coming in judgment, it also speaks of the death of the one who is receiving of that judgment. And then what follows in verses 3 through 6 are his threefold answer to what was asked here, why his garments are red. And the first reason we see why his apparel is red is because the judgment that is brought is by the Lord and by the Lord alone. Judgment in judgment, when it comes to judgment, the Lord acts alone. He acted alone at creation, only he is able to create. He acted alone at salvation, only he is able to save. And he will act alone at judgment as well, because it's only the Lord who is able to exercise divine and pure judgment. What's the problem that we see in society today, especially now that we have the ability to, ability to uh, enact DNA tests? They go back and they find some guys that have been in prison for 20 or 30 years or whatever. They rerun the DNA test and they find these guys were innocent. Now, they were supposedly proven guilty beyond any doubt. But man in his imperfection doesn't always have all of the information, isn't always able to judge justly and rightly. So it's only God who is able to truly judge in a way that is absolute righteous and absolute just. In Revelation 19, 13, he was clothed with the robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Notice what we are going to be at that time. We are going to be dressed in the righteousness of Christ. We have those white linen robes. We don't have the blood upon us. We don't have the blood upon us because we're not exercising judgment. We're unable to exercise judgment. We're worthy to be judged, but we're not worthy to judge. Only God is worthy to judge. And that's why Christ has this picture of this stain upon him. But we, we simply are clothed in the purity of Christ. Secondly, his clothes are stained because judgment, judgment was necessary. Look at verse 4. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. The first part, in my heart, this means this has happened. Judgment has happened according to his plans and purposes. What did Jesus say when he was asked when the end times were going to be? This is according to my Father's timetable. The Father is the one who knows the day and the hour. He's got it planned. It's according to his divine calendar. As for us, we continue to wait on the Lord, being in God's word, fellowshipping with one another, praying, witnessing, doing the things God has called us to do, but as far as when these times are going to be upon us, that's not to be our concern. But it is the concern of God, and he's got the time, if you will, marked on his holy calendar. Then the last part of verse 4, and the year of my redeemed has come. This means that judgment has occurred according to his will. When it does, does come time for judgment, it's going to happen according to the desires of God. Isaiah 61, verse 2, it speaks of the acceptable year of the Lord, 
and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Again, the reason for judgment is the breaking of God's law, the rejection of Christ, and the validation of grace. The breaking of God's law, the rejection of Christ, and the validation of grace. That's part of what's going to happen, and we see in Revelation chapter 5, we see the church in heaven, and we see, well, you have the picture of the apostle John there, and you have the title deed to the earth, and the voice yells out, who's worthy to take this deed? And John's looking around, and it's like, nobody's worthy to take possession of the earth. And then all of a sudden, out of the midst of him comes this lamb as if it has been slaughtered. And he's the one who is worthy to take the deed because it's he who paid the price for all of humanity. His blood was shed so that our blood would not need to be shed. And then thirdly, we see his apparel is stained blood red because his anger has been appeased. Verses 5 through 6. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me. Now, this is the Lord speaking. And my own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger and made them drunk in my fury and brought down their strength to the earth. There are two ways that God's anger toward sin is satisfied. It's either going to be by the blood of the lamb or by the blood of man. Or maybe I should say by the blood of judgment. It's either by the blood of Lamb and those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they will not be judged. They will not see judgment. Or it's going to be receiving judgment. Jesus Christ is the only one because he hadn't sinned. He's the only one that could pay the price for anybody else's sin. As far as you and I, as I've pointed out before, if we were to pay the price for sin or at least attempt to, it would be eternity upon our own cross, be eternity of us attempting to do so never being able to achieve that, never being able to pay the price. This is called the doctrine of propitiation. It's what we see in Romans. Why don't you turn over to Romans, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Now, if you recall what Paul's doing in the first part of Romans, he looks in chapter 1 and verses 18 through 32, and he sees the pagan. And he speaks of the sinful nature of the pagan. Then he enters into chapter 2, and he's looking at the self-righteous. He's even looking at the Jew. And he, he's looking at all of the landscape of humanity apart from Christ. And he comes to one main conclusion, and he starts that again in chapter 3. But look at verse uh, 10. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb, and their tongues have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Again, nobody's going to be able to offer an excuse. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 20 looms very large because this is an accumulation of all that was said before it in this letter to the Romans. Again, all of the, the, the pagan and the Jew, the religious, the righteous, self-righteous, that all comes to this one conclusion of, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. What is mankind to do? Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's that which the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, was always speaking towards, the revelation of the righteousness of God that will be placed upon mankind. It's never intended for man to be righteous through the keeping of the law, because again, we know that can't happen. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So again, not by the deeds of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. To all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, 
being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. That word propitiation means the cost paid to appease anger. As the anger of God towards sinners and self-righteous people, well, Christ, he, he satisfied that. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance or tolerance, God has passed over the sins that were previous committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's what God has been working towards throughout all of those years. Mankind has been trying to appease the anger of God through righteous deeds. When those would fail, he'd go to make the sacrifice. But as we pointed out before, how many sacrifices would you need to cover your sin? In actuality, it'd be a perpetual sacrifice, never able to truly cover all of your sins. And as you would be continuing to do those things, there would never be that assurance or satisfaction of being right in the sight of Jesus Christ. I mean, I know through all of my religious life, before my relationship with Christ, I realized that. I, I never would admit it, and I couldn't explain it like I just read it or tried to explain it to you. But nonetheless, I knew that I was set apart from the Lord. I knew that there was something wrong. Because why? Because the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And I knew that there was something wrong, desperately wrong with my life. It's because of my sin that there was that anger of God in that one day that I was going to be judged. God still loved me, but there was still that anger that was directed towards me. He had loved me to a degree. He sent his son, but I was refusing that great gift that he had for me. And in that refusal of that great gift, I was in fact condemning myself before this holy God. And as I did that, as I did that, I was due all the judgment that, well, every mouth would have been stopped and mine would have been stopped as well. But yet, while I was still dead in my sins and my trespasses, Christ died for me. And then there came that day when I realized it and I entered into salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you should have that very same testimony. It should be that testimony in your life. See, so many people kind of just progress into the church. They just kind of enter in and they, they, they probably sense the Spirit here. It's a good place to be, nice people and all of that. And they kind of draw comfortable within there, within the church. But there's got to be the recognition of the sinful nature that we possess. We've got to come to that point of repentance of that sinful nature. That has to happen. You can't just migrate into the church. It's Christ who causes you to become that new creation in Christ in which you become part of the church. And so here we have the prophet as he's speaking to this man. Who is this man? He's seeing something mighty. He's seeing something very unique in this man. He's seeing the results of the judgment that this man has exercised. In this particular context, Isaiah the prophet, as he's asking this, would be God's people seeing the things that are going on and seeing the judgment that God has said was going to happen and does happen in these nations or towards these nations that are contrary to God. Now, as he's seeing this, he's coming to the realization again, and that's where I was going with Revelation chapter 5 earlier, the, the church, as they break out in that heavenly choir, they've come to a fresh awareness of God's grace. Isaiah now, he's come to the fresh awareness of God's grace. When you understand the judgment of the world and you realize that that's not going to apply to you, it should cause you to sing that new song. Again, when the Bible says, and he sang a new song, that's in response to a fresh awareness of the goodness of God. And so what we have in the remainder of Isaiah chapter 63 is that greater awareness of grace, and he responds with this prayer of praise. This prayer of praise to God. And the first one, the first item that we see in this prayer of praise well, it's all based upon what God has done for mankind. Look at verse 7. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed upon us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. Now, included in the context because what he has done, it lends towards the assurance of what he is going to do. 
I will mention, he's speaking of a future event, a future event of what God's going to do. And so he's speaking for Israel, but I think we can put ourselves in that place as well. So in the midst of judgment, the prophet is reminded of, first of all, great goodness. God, God is absolutely pure and good. And he's understanding the magnitude of the goodness of God towards mankind. Now, if Jesus never came, if God never sent his son, then man wouldn't recognize God as being good. We just recognize him as being judged. But it's through this man who exercised judgment previously in this chapter that the author here, that Isaiah, is recognizing the great goodness of God. Also, it's divine mercies, that we're not getting what we deserve. He's understanding that our, all are guilty in the sight of God. And also, he speaks of this abundant loving kindness. Now, it's good for somebody to be kind to you. You can be kind to a stranger that you see out in the street. There's people in here, and I know the majority of the people here, we're generally kind to one another. But to have somebody be loving towards you and their kindness spring forth from that love, that's taken it to a greater level. And so he's speaking of this love that God has and this kindness that he's expressed towards mankind. Why? Well, he's just experienced judgment. He's looking at the other part of it. It's because God loves us that he is kind towards us. Secondly, in this prayer of praise is a reminder of how God birthed his people. Look at verse 8. For he said, surely they are my people. He's taking possession of these people. My people, children who will not lie. So he became their savior. You see in Exodus, when they traveled through the Red Sea, it's as if God's people came out of Egypt and were birthed through the Red Sea. That was definitely a work of God as he split that sea, as he had them delivered from Egyptian captivity. And so once again, just as truly as a mother loves this child, he's seeing that, well, the reason that we came into being was because of the love that God has for us. Thirdly, included in this prayer of praise is his care for his people. Verse 9, in all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. <clears throat> what he's saying here is, the first part, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. It just kind of reminds me, as we are afflicted, as we suffer, as we go through this life, he too bears our afflictions, and he bears our sufferings. He's there for us, and he's there to help us through these things as they go on. God does not care for his people from a distance, but he enters into our lives in every aspect. And never was that greater, never was it better seen than upon the cross as Christ entered into humanity and bore our afflictions upon the cross. He continues to bear our afflictions even today. We have a God whose ministry never tires, it never quits. It's interesting as well, again in verse 9, in all their afflictions he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. Literally, translation says, the angel from his face. And speaking, notice angel there is capitalized. The idea is it's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was really Christ who had led them through that wilderness. Fourthly, in this prayer of praise, we have the recognition of his grace once again, verses 10 through 14. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, Where is he who brought them out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them, who led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm? dividing the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness that they might not stumble, as a beast goes down into the valley and the Spirit of the Lord causes him to rest. So you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. Again, it, it speaks of the grace of God. The people as, well, as soon as they wandered out from Egypt, what did they do? They started rebelling. They were referred to as a stiff-necked people. We look through the Old Testament, we constantly see these people who God had literally revealed himself to, they're constantly turning away from God. And we can look at all those people and look at all that went on, we can say, those were bad people, they were deserving of judgment. But in all those occurrences of those people, I'm sure you can find parallels in your life as well. I can find parallels in my life. I can find parallels in my life when I rebelled against God. 
can find parallels in my life when I've acted contrary to his will or contrary to his word. I can find parallels in my life in so many things. And God didn't destroy them. God didn't destroy me. But he saved me. He washed me. He cleanses me. And he keeps me. We have the existence of the Holy Spirit here as well. It says in verse 10, but they rebelled and they grieved the Holy Spirit. Oh, how we grieve the Holy Spirit when we rebel as well. It says in verse 11 that he put his Holy Spirit within them. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14 tells us that the existence of the Holy Spirit is God sealing his people. Just as surely as Israel is sealed, we were sealed on the day that we believe. We're not with the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Holy Spirit is the proof of his promise that one day we will be with him. I used the illustration before. My wife and I, we became engaged. We kind of went around, you know, maybe a little backwards. We got engaged, and then I bought her the ring later. Matter of fact, we went down to L.A., and we went shopping. That Somebody knew of a place down there, and we bought a ring, and it wasn't going to be ready until the following week, and so we made plans the next Saturday to go back and get a ring. And so I went back. I took off work one day, and I was going to surprise her. I went and got the ring, and I did the whole thing. I got Because I'm a sweet guy. I went there, and I got down on my knees and asked her, will you marry me? And she said yes, because we've been married for 36 years. And, um, and I gave her the ring. And the ring was the sealing of this promise that she could look at that during our whole engagement time and she could look at that ring and it would remind her of the promise that I made towards her and really the promise that we made towards one another to get married. And so during some hard times or whatever, again, or doubtful times, she could look at that and remember the promise until that day that it happened. Now, as for me, I paid the price. I paid the price for that ring. As for her, she was receptive of the promise, and that promise, well, it, it ministered to her. And it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. At times of doubt, just look at the Holy Spirit in my life. Times of insurity, I can look at the Holy Spirit in my life. Times when it seems like God has forsaken me, I see the Holy Spirit. That was the engagement ring, if you will, that God has given us through his promise. He sealed his promise with the giving of the Holy Spirit. And so we can look at the existence of the Holy Spirit in our life that we receive upon salvation, and we're reminded of the promises or the surety of the promises of God. And then lastly, we see a plea for mercy in this prayer of praise, verses 15 through 19. Look down from heaven and see from your habitation holy and glorious. Where are your zeal and your strength, the yearning of your heart and your mercies toward me? Doubtless you are our father, though Abraham was ignorant of us, and Israel does not acknowledge us, but you, O Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer from everlasting is your name. O Lord, why have you made us stray from your ways and harden our heart from your fear? Return to your servants' sake and tribes of your inheritance. Your holy people have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries are trodden down, um, have trodden down your sanctuary. We have become like those of old over whom you never ruled, those who were never called by your name. What he's doing is he's looking at the state of Israel at that point. He's coming to the realization, God does great things. I see the judgment that comes upon the nation. I rejoice in the light of that judgment because God has given us grace, but then he comes to the awareness of the state of society of that day. And again, just as with Isaiah, that should grieve our heart. That should motivate us. See, we should not take joy in the judgment of the nation. We, should not, we ought not to take joy in the judgment that's going to happen to the people that are outside of the confines of the church. Matter of fact, just as the prophet has this heart of, 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 of mercy towards these people and is crying out to God, we need to be a people who cry out to God for, for those whom he brings into our life. See, with each study, we need to receive the instruction that God has as if God is commissioning us for his great purpose, which he is. And so I rejoice in the, in, in the end times. I rejoice in the judgment that's going to come. Not that I want to see anybody judge, but I know that God's judgment is divine in nature. And because, of I, because I see that, I rejoice, and the grace of God has been bestowed upon me. But as for today, it ought to grieve our hearts just that bit. Grieve our hearts for those who are living a life apart from God. When we see somebody that we know that wasn't saved, 
and we see him slip into eternity apart from Christ, a little bit of us should die. We need to be motivated by these things. We need to tell the world of these things. We need to be those witnesses going forth and making disciples, giving glory to God that we would see more people pulled from destruction and brought into the kingdom of God. Father, I just pray, Lord, as we look at your word and we see these glorious things that are due to happen in the future, Lord, that we would take heart, that we would take heart and be strengthened through the power of your might, that we would be motivated in this great ministry, that, Father, we would be a people who are found faithful. And, Lord, just as this prophet, he just gazed at you and, Lord, was just filled with wonder, I pray, Father, that that would never pass from us. And just as he realized, Lord, just the magnitude of the love that you had for him, and it was something that excited him, I pray that that would not pass from us. But I pray, Father, again, that we would have a heart for those, Lord, who are apart from you, that, Lord, we would forever be faithful in this ministry that you have laid before us, that, Father, you would watch over and keep us for those purposes. Lord, I lift up those who have come out tonight. I pray that you would watch over them and keep them. I pray, Father, for the unbeliever in our lives, again, that we would be faithful to speak of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that you would just be glorified through our humble efforts, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you all stand, please?